Life Church Panania is open on your computer or on your phone or in your home. Welcome. It's good to be with you. We are your hosts. And I am Ian. And I'm Eleanor. And we're going to guide you through our service today. Thank you for tuning in. The theme that we're going to pick up today is how to get ready for Jesus' return. And we're continuing our studies as we work through Luke chapter 12. Have you printed out your Go Deeper sheet? That might help to follow through as we think more deeply about this text. But before we do anything else, let's pray. Our gracious Father, thank you for your great plan of the ages, a plan that began before creation, a plan that extends through all of history, a plan that culminates in eternity future, a wonderful plan. And we look forward to the next great step of that plan as Jesus comes back again. Uh, help us to be prepared for all that he's coming to do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The first song that we have for today is a song of praise, a song of anticipation, a, a song that in a way is also a prayer. I want to praise you, Lord, among many other things. Praise you, Lord. Indeed, that is the prayer of our hearts that we would praise and serve and love him more and more each day. Now, what's happening? What do we need to listen up for and things that are coming? Today, in our physical service, we're going to close with Myanmar morning tea. Every month we have a morning tea to celebrate all that we have by the grace of God and make a contribution to support the orphans in Myanmar. Sure, we don't help them all, but we do help about 40 of them. And it's a great way to remind ourselves that we are blessed to be a blessing. 
then tomorrow hour of power we're going to set aside an hour where we focus on prayer and cry out to god for what he is going to be doing that's tomorrow and then on wednesday wherever you are you can tune in to the online bible study 7 30 to 8 30 on wednesday evening australian eastern summertime and if you email me on this address i'll be able to email you a link just before we start and then next sunday we're going to be celebrating the lord's supper so come prepared to remember all that he's done for us we're going to stop again for prayer can i pray for you for the things that you go through for the concerns that you have and then we'll join our prayers as we pray for others let's bow before our lord most gracious father thank you that you warmly welcome us into your presence you embrace us and and you hear our hearts as well as the words that we speak and as we come to you it's with a sense that you love us and you care for us and you want the best for us and in spite of the difficulties of this world your grace is sufficient to carry us through and so we come and we bring our concerns to you we offer you our heartaches the the people who disappoint us the frustrations that we face with our human limitations the but also the joys and the celebrations thank you that you are good to us open our eyes that we would see the balance of all of this so that we can celebrate how great thou art while remembering our weakness but made perfect in your strength so take and use all that we are with all that we are and all of our limitations and all of our possibilities to extend your kingdom open our eyes and our ears to the opportunities that you bring to us so that we will not be slow or reluctant but prepared in heart and mind to be able to speak of the kingdom and then to live the kingdom with integrity so guide all that we do as we go out into this world in jesus name amen we back up our prayers with our acts of, of service and our tithes and our offerings thank you for those who share with us from around the world these uh, account numbers directly to the broader work of the church or specifically to our mission in Myanmar those numbers are also on your go deeper sheet thank you for sharing here's our next song what a, what a great song it is too it's a song of commitment as we prepare for Jesus to come again we are living in service of him as for me and as for my house we will serve the Lord
that's a commitment. As for me and my house, no options, no alternatives. We will serve the Lord. Now we come to hear from God's word. We're continuing our studies in Luke chapter 12. And here we are going to read from verse 39 through to verse 44. Hear the word of the Lord. This you know. If the master of the house had insight of what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house be broken into. You also be prepared, because at an hour you do not expect him, the Son of Man will come. So Peter replied, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else also? And the Lord replied, Who then is the faithful and sensible manager whom the master promotes for the well-being of his servants to give them their correct portion at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whose master returns to find him doing this. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, how do we get ready for Jesus' return? He was very clear. He said, quite specifically, be prepared because the Son of Man will come. So how are you going to be prepared? Make a nice meal for him? Get yourself all spruced up? But pack your bags uh, with the anticipation that he's not coming to live with you, but to take you to live with him. All of these options are currently being practiced by various uh, Christians around the world or various Bible readers around the world. Well, we're going to focus on what Jesus actually said, and he did say, be prepared, because the Son of Man will come. So how do we prepare? If you're following in your Go Deeper sheets and taking notes, then there's three things that you need to pick up about being prepared. The first of them is this. I prepare my head. The reason is there are things that I can know. Okay, there's things that I don't know, but I need to be prepared from the head down. The first of them is this. I prepare for what I do don't know. Now, Jesus said, and to fill it out more specifically, you also be prepared because at an hour you do not expect him, the Son of Man will come. So the things that we just don't know, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to burst some bubbles here. Sorry, oh, well, look, I'm not sorry that I'll be redirecting you away from some false expectations to understand what the Bible actually says about Jesus' return and the signs that we can look for. So let me take you back to Jesus speaking. And he says, well, well let's give you the, the context. They're in the temple in Jerusalem, the temple precincts. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Now, have you got the context in which the following teaching is going to take place? Jesus and the disciples are in the precincts of Herod's temple. It's beautiful. It's, it probably would have been one of the wonders of the world if believers had been around to be able to uh, make the list of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was that spectacular. And then in response to the astonishing words that Jesus speaks, the disciples then respond Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Now, again, it's within this context. Jesus is talking about Herod's temple. When will Herod's temple be thrown down? What are the signs that lead up to the destruction of Herod's temple with what not one stone left upon another? It's not what he's about to say is not about the second coming. It's about the destruction of the temple. 
So Jesus responds, you will hear of wars and rumors of war. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. They're the signs. And then Jesus goes on to say, truly, I tell you, in response to when this has happened, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. So in that generation, in the time that Jesus and the disciples were alive, they would see all of these things, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, fearful events and signs from heaven. It all took place in their generation. In fact, Jesus spoke those words in the week leading up to Passover in the year 30 AD. A generation of the Bible is 40 years. And what do you find? That in the week before Passover, 70 AD, what Jesus predicted came true. Specifically, literally, precisely, fully. Jesus' words always come true. But the other part of this is, I prepare for what I do know. You also be prepared, because although he's coming at an hour you do not expect him, the Son of Man will come. Of that we can be certain. In the upper room, Jesus spoke to his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What do we know? We know that Jesus is coming again. Back in our text in Luke chapter 12, you also be prepared because at an hour you do not expect him. The Son of Man will come. Well, what are the signs then? If he's coming when we do not expect him, then there can't be any signs that lead up to expecting him. Ah, but Jesus did give us some signs. In another text, he told us exactly what to expect. What are the signs leading up to his coming? We're in Luke chapter 12 now. We'll deal with this in detail when we get up to chapter 17. Look at this, the signs of his return. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. So what was so special about Noah's day? It's this, Jesus says, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark and then the flood came and destroyed them all. That was the sign eating, drinking, and marrying. He goes on and gives another example. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. So these are the signs of the second coming. Wars and rumours of war, etc., they're signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem's temple in AD 70. But these are the signs of the second coming. Eating, drinking, marrying, buying, selling, planting, building. So when you have lunch today, remind yourself that that is a sign of the second coming. When you see a wedding car driving down the street with its white ribbon, Call out to them, you are a sign of the second coming. When you're pushing your trolley through the supermarket, you're buying and they are selling. Remind yourself, you are a sign of the second coming. When you're pottering in your garden or in your shed, planting or building something, you are a sign of the second coming. This is what Jesus says is going to be like in the days that he returns. Is that helpful? Oh, 
Maybe you want some more detail about that. Well, Jesus did give us something else to help us understand when he's coming back. He said, about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. When is Jesus coming back? We don't know. Now, there are no shortages of books in Christian bookshops. Uh, telling you all about signs to look out for. But Jesus cuts across them all and says, no one knows in the Father's plan. And here is the members of the Trinity working together in partnership and in uniqueness. Only the Father has set the date and Jesus is ready when that time comes. So Jesus says, be prepared because of what you know and don't know. You know he will come again, but you don't know when to expect him. That's how we prepare, by being ready at any time. Now, there's a second thing that we can go on to. Not only do we prepare from our head down, we also prepare our hearts. We prepare our hearts because there are things that we can do. How do we prepare our hearts? Again, Jesus is helping us prepare for his return. I prepare by being personally faithful, full of faith. The Lord replied, who then is the faithful and sensible manager? That's us. How do we be faithful? Well, let me do a little illustration for you. Here is the benchmark for reality, for truth, and it is the Bible. I feel sorry for people who don't have the Bible as their benchmark because what have they got to go by by determining what's real and what's truth? No one but their own opinion or someone else's. And if someone doesn't like it, they can just say to them, I reject your reality and substitute my own. That's why we need God's word to give us the benchmark of what is true. Now, against that, there is the problem that as we get further and further away from God's benchmark, we become more and more ignorant and have more and more unrealistic expectations of who God is and what he does. And then as we get further and further away from Scripture, we have an increasing inability to survive any crisis and an increasing likelihood that we will lose whatever little faith we had in whatever it was we were clinging to and become de-churched. We'll just fall away. The further we fall away, the further we will fall away. We need to overcome our ignorance and our unrealistic expectations by coming back to God's benchmark, the truth of Scripture. So if we are going to be faithful and full of faith, where do we turn? Well, probably the best place to turn is what theologians call the faith chapter. It's Hebrews chapter 11. Let's have a look at some of what it says. The opening verse of Hebrews 11 gives us a definition. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So faith is our confidence. We, we can have confidence in God's word, confidence in scripture. People have been looking for thousands of years to find mistakes or contradictions or errors, and not one of them has been found. No one has been able to contradict God's word. That's why we can have confidence in what it says, hope in what it promises, and assurance that it is reliable. We move on to the next verse. How do we express our faith? It begins in Genesis chapter 1. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. If you don't have a creator God who brings everything into being at his own command to function as he commands, then all you've got is chaos, random chance. What sort of universe is that to live in? What sort of, of God is that? We have faith in the Creator. 
The next verse, faith is about giving God our best. Next verse, faith is about living to please God. Next verse, faith is about earnestly seeking God, not just drifting along knowing about God, but earnestly seeking God. The next verse, faith is about fear of judgment because there is justice in the world that God created. The next verse, faith is about stepping out to being obedient to what God says, even if you don't get immediate results. And we, look, we could go on and on and on, but we're not doing a, a, a study in Hebrews 11. Let's come back to our text in Luke chapter 12. I prepare for Jesus' return, not only by being faithful, but by being sense able. I'm to be sensible. The Lord replied, who then is the faithful first and secondly, sensible manager? So I'm to be using all that I am, all my senses, because that enables me, sense able, to be able to do what God requires of me. Now, There are lots of things we could turn to, but here's a great one. Philippians 4. Whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy, excellent, think on these things. And you know what's happening? When I'm filling my head and my heart and my life and my relationships and my home with things that are true, honourable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, then there is no room for anything negative, any anything that is pulling me down, anything that pulls others down. And then when I'm thinking about these things, I then can put into practice what's filling my head because my thoughts will indeed overflow into what comes out through my words and my hands. Thoughts are the beginning. And we're to be sensible, to sense what God is putting into our lives so that we can be filled with that and let that overflow. So how do we prepare? Be prepared because the Son of Man will come. So be faithful and sensible. This is... Your preparation, ready to meet Jesus, full of faith and sense able. There's just one more thing, and that's I prepare my hands. Uh, We're becoming more and more practical as we go through. I prepare my hands because there are things that I need to not just do, but achieve. How do I do that? How do I put that into practice? I prepare for Jesus' return by caring about others. It's for the well-being of his servants. That's why God has gifted me, equipped me. That's, That's why you have the talents and gifts you have, so that you can use who you are for the well-being of others. Here's a verse that helps us see that. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. What is it? If you love one another, that's the well-being of God's servants. And that is your great witness, that you love your fellow disciples and put that into practice. So I prepare. And another way is I prepare by service to others. I care about others and I then do service to others and the end of this to give them their correct portion at the proper time so here are two things the correct portion and the correct time some really interesting discussions came out of our go deeper sheet questions from last week about acing my serve about service so how do i balance my service what do i do or not do Good question. Service is governed by, first of all, the relationships that we have. Here's an Old Testament and a New Testament illustration. The Old Testament illustration is 
Naomi and Ruth come back home again you know, with nothing, uh, but you know, just, just nothing. And Boaz is their relative who can come to their rescue, and he's willing to do that. But he can't because there is a closer relative whose responsibility it is to step in and be the redeemer of Naomi and Ruth. That's how it is, because relationships established by God mean that the closer you are to someone, the higher your level of responsibility. Relationship, responsibility. We find the same thing in 1 Timothy 5.4, where the church's resources are to be used to help those who are alone. With this caveat, they're not to be used by those who have family whose responsibility it is to look after their elderly or their lonely so that the church's meagre resources aren't directed away from a greater need. So our service is first of all governed by the relationships that we have. You are placed into a family of origin and that's your first level of care. The service we give is also governed by the capacity of the person who we might serve. Now, there's a really interesting dynamic in Galatians chapter 6. Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. Here we are, we're caring for other people. But then a breath later in verse 5, it says, oh no, carry your own load. How do we balance that? The wording is in burden or load. We're to bear one another's burdens when the, the weight is crushing them down, when there is something that they can't carry alone. That's a burden and that's where we get in and we lift up one another and help each other. Not that we take away their burden, but we help them bear their own burden. And then that's balanced in verse 5, where each of us has a load to carry. Each of us has our own responsibilities. Each of us carry things that are weighing down on us. That's our responsibility. We can't shirk that. We can't ask someone else to do that. We're to be strong and carry our own load and then offer assistance to help others. Bear the burden, the overload that others are carrying. So service is governed by relationship and capacity. And just one more, by boundaries. This, this in a way, embraces the, the former two. We are each responsible for our own lives. We cannot blame others or circumstances or anything else. Each of us walks our own path and is responsible and accountable for the choices that we make. And we can't sh shunt that off onto someone else. So that is how we serve one another. And it also adds, Jesus adds, at the proper time. Do you remember all those years ago when we went to school and you learned two plus two is four? That's your starting point. And then they added in times tables and then later on, you got into things like square roots. And who knows, it probably gets even more complex after that. But you didn't start down there. At the proper time, you get little by little to add in and build up and you lay down the foundations. Well, in the same way, Scripture tells us to grow to, to add up step by step, grow in the grace and grow in the knowledge. Now, just that is important. Grace is more important than knowledge. Grace comes first. The order of the words is important. So first of all, grow in grace so that even stuff that, well, you can't get your head around all the theology, it doesn't matter. It's Christ in you, flowing through you. It's you loving one another, granting to others 
their proper portion at the proper time. Grow in grace, but don't stop by just being a nice person. Grow in knowledge as well. And it's not just Bible knowledge. Notice what knowledge it is. It's knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We're to grow up into him, in our relationship with him. So, where do we wrap all this up? We're to be prepared. Jesus is coming again, and we're supposed to be ready for that. Be prepared because the Son of Man will come. So what's the blessing? It is for us as his servants, whose master Jesus is coming, and finding us also caring for one another. That is how we prepare for Jesus' return. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you have a great plan. Thank you that there is an end point. Thank you that it's drawing ever nearer and the return of Jesus is about to take place. Help us to be prepared in our head, in our hearts and with our hands so that in every way, when he comes back, he will look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, they're the words that we long to hear. Help us to be prepared by our choices every day to enable those words to be true. And we thank you for his soon return in his own name. Amen. Now, yes, we're compliant. Here are the questions that are also on your Go Deeper sheet. And we hope that, if possible, you'll be able to join us. Now, one last song as we wrap up our time together. I'm going to follow you, Jesus, whatever it takes, wherever it takes me. I'm going to, I am prepared to follow you. I am going to follow you, Jesus.
Yes, following him is the best path through life. Oh, no, no, no. It is the only path through life and the only path to eternal life. Jesus is coming again. And until that day, the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine on you and keep preparing you for the time when you'll meet him in the sky. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, go off and enjoy a wonderful morning tea, remembering how rich we are in so many ways and how blessed we are to be able to help others. God bless. See you next time.